as uh, Carl already said. And today I'm going to talk about um, eTech guidelines for future tech extensions um, dash revisited. And um, I came very late to this conference uh, this year, decided very late to, to actually join, and then Steve and Carl said, uh, why don't you uh, give a talk uh, about something exciting like uh, when is Latex 3 coming? Something uh, sensible like this, and uh, I said, mm, okay. Why well, we come to this on Wednesday? Uh, so I was thinking, what can I do in a short term to, to, to give a talk here? And um, I was asking myself, what I'm currently doing that is interesting uh, in, in one way or the other. And uh, what I'm currently doing is uh, thinking again about uh, complex output routines and flow placements. And uh, as part of that, uh, thinking about how to re-break paragraphs that have already been broken. Um, because you want to place them in a different manner. For example, if you have floats that have captions, and the caption need to go somewhere, depending on where it goes, it might have a different shape, or should have a different shape. So that's a question of where you want to re-break paragraphs. And so that question is actually very old. Um, and that is something that I was giving a talk on in 1990, I think. So it's 22 years ago where I raised a bunch of questions about, um, let's see if this works, about high quality typesetting and what actually can't be achieved with tech, tech three at that point in time, it was just a year old. And I was asking what kind of high quality typesetting issues are resolved with tech and what are open that we need to get further grip onto it, and uh, that was the abstract of that talk at that point in time. And so, when I was thinking about all this, I was starting to think that maybe it's interesting to see what happened for 10 years after tech was actually being developed initially, but 20 years from that point on where I raised all those questions. <laughs> and so, um, I finally decided to make my talk go like this, taking the old talk and see what happens since then and uh, what can we achieve now and what is still sort of a question that is open. So a little bit of history um, and by the way I, I took the wrong computer with me. I have a blank screen here so I always have to sort of try to walk what's actually there because there's nothing in, in front of me here. At the moment, um, it's probably even now too small for the back, but uh, this way it's halfway decent. Okay, a um, little bit of history. Uh, in 1979 or something about then, Don made this uh, famous sabbatical and gave his some of his students the task to to implement some ideas he had about a typesetting system. Um, which was supposed to be half a year's job or something. <laughs> and uh, then he came back and uh, did the whole thing again from what, what his students did and um, implemented the first, first version of tech. And then there was some development happening further. And then in uh, 82, we got to the first sort of really more widely used uh, tech implementation, which then stands for about 10 years unchallenged and being used more and more across the world, initially in America, of course, and then came to Europe. And the European people were not too happy about the fact that um, the world was kind of classified into something that has 26 letters and uh, something that has a few more, which were not, were only added as an afterthought, but not really a part of the tech machinery uh, in, in a very decent way. And so, in whatever that was, 1989, um, a bunch of people from Europe came to Stanford and made a pledge to, to Don to um, open up tech for real good use with um, Latin-based languages that are having more characters than just those 26. 
and, and, and being able to do proper hyphenation using more than one language and so on and so forth. And uh, well, Dylan got convinced that that might be a good idea. And so he um, introduced, I don't know, about 20 additional kind of primitives um, that were asked for and uh, the ability to, to hyphenate more than one language and, and do 8-bit fonts. And that then became um, Tech 3. And um, at the same time, or shortly afterwards, Don said, that's it. <laughs> at least as far as I'm concerned, this is the final version. Um, it is good enough for me. Uh, it is not necessarily good enough for everybody. He understands that, but he is not going to actually do anything further, and he will keep that system the way it is. Um, so that it's stable and, and useful and other people could implement extensions, new versions, whatever, um, to serve other needs. And uh, one year after that conference, I then took on this uh, idea of looking at various topics in high quality typesetting um, that are solved by tech or are not solved by tech. And that was the paper that I gave in um, College Station, in Texas, um, at that point in time. And um, basically raising questions about things that didn't quite work well, at least not automatically. And um, actually I got a quite a lot of heat back then from people who were really sort of um, feeling that this is a blasphemy or something. Uh, that, um, I would challenge uh, tech to be a good prototype of high quality typesetting um, rather than the end of the road, basically. And um, yeah, so that was back then always or all type of open questions. So if we want to look a little bit of what happened since then, let's see if I can make this one here. We get to something like this picture, and um, this is not done by me, it's done by, by somebody, I think it's a German guy who, who made these nice graphics, uh, showing all the kind of tech engine variations that have been developed over time, maybe not all of them, but a lot, uh, and how they relate to each other, um, starting with the very early tech at the very top, um, then there are a couple of uh, sort of sidelines and, and, and things um, grew in different directions. So what we have here is on one hand, if something's going to happen, let's see if this is going to happen. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have PTEC, I think it's, it's publisher tech or something actually where, where it came from, very early. It comes really out of out of the um, tech 82 air, at a time, where people in Japan, I think, uh, found that there are certain um, things that they couldn't really uh, make tech work with with with, uh, with uh, their language, the typesetting direction, uh, especially vertical typesetting in a in a proper manner and uh, multi-byte extensions for for the fonts that they had. Uh, so that, that was an early um, successor, if you like, or a path that is still quite, quite in use, I understand, right? And um, so this is one, uh, trying to solve some questions of, of the, um, these kind of scripts. And then one influential one is, um, has been eTech, which was actually sort of a, an intermediate step um, the Dante team in Germany, the Dante um, user group, uh, decided to implement what is called NTS, uh, trying to re-implement tech in, in Java back then, and um, providing a platform for future extensions by, by turning that, what was sometimes called spaghetti code, in, inside <laughs> tech into proper language, which was the first of this. Okay, so then, as I already said, NTS, uh, big ideas, unfortunately big failure in the sense that uh, it's just 
it just ended up being a dead end because you couldn't do anything with it. Um, nevertheless, I think it was an important dead end to understand that this is not the way to go forward. Um, so that, that didn't really get any users, I would, would say. Uh, another branch that started at some point was uh, John Place and uh, Janis Aralampos was Omega, trying to get Unicode sort of into the picture um, with restrictions, with important ideas um, used for complex scripts and um, had some success um, with RLEF and, and, and those kind of things. Um, another branch which came up uh, was um, PDF Tech by uh, Fun. Uh, thumb down, it is right. Uh, and that was a very, very important step forward for, for the tech world because, um, well, first of all, the initial idea was just to, to um, produce PDF directly. But on top of that, he started to implement additional ideas um, with uh, allowing uh, a good number of um, typography, micro typography enhancement to happen. So this is uh, kind of a very rich um, implementation um, and it's the one that you nowadays typically get as a default when whenever you actually use tech and tech life or mic tech or something what actually runs is, is PDF tech um, unless you really work hard to make it run uh, <laughs> something else. Um, Another branch, uh, CTEC, um, certain other aspects about open type font support, multiple directions, um, and last but not least, uh, UTF-8. And then, um, something that came a couple of years ago, starting to come, I would say, is LuaTech. And the interesting bit about LuaTech is that um, it Im embeds a scripting language. So suddenly we got sort of a completely different world of, of, of um, programming possibilities. It also gave for the first time something that NTS was thinking about providing in, in some way or form, access to a large amount of the, um, the internal tech uh, data structures that you can directly then manipulate and that in all the other engines have been hidden. So. Um, you, you can actually get to the internal lists or you get to all the parameters of the mass type setting which are buried in the fonts and now you can actually manipulate those kind of things if you want to. So there's a lot of extension in that direction. And it provides hooks, very important hooks to, to actually get into the various places. Not necessarily all of it. I mean, historically, I guess Lua Tech was very bound to what Hans Hagen was doing. So when Hans needed something for context, what, what, what ended up in Blue Attack easily, if somebody else needed something for something else, it wasn't necessarily <laughs> as, as fast as that, as that, if ever. But I mean, that's the way things go. And um, it's quite an important thing, bringing a lot of the strands together, because it is introducing or incorporating ideas from both PDF tech and, and, and from the various other developments as well. So that is bringing things together before. And then, for those people who have been in uh, San Francisco uh, two years ago, um, <laughs> we obviously have the most important one, <laughs> uh, which is going to make all the other stuff obsolete. Um, now, I'm not quite sure what the status of this is. Of course, uh, this bell ringing is an old Nothing to ring here. Yeah. <laughs> um, but obviously that, that is something not to underestimate because it solves all the problems we don't know about. So maybe that's the answer to what I'm going to talk about um, in the next part of the talk. Okay, so that's kind of the history. So actually a lot happened in terms of engines as well. So what does this mean for the question I uh, posed 22 years ago? And nothing because I don't get back. Let's try. Okay, so here we are. 
So let's look at what I was asking at that point in time. And I was asking questions in those categories. Now this is not ordered by the type of um, importance. Uh, it is ordered just by the, by the order of the, of the um, talk that I gave back then. Just kept the, the initial order. And uh, it has a bit of a color coding here. Basically, it means dark red is something we haven't even got, got, got a handle on still. Uh, orange is going to say, basically, yeah, we got a handle on. We haven't just not used the handle yet. <laughs> uh, and um, yellow is, 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 is kind of the same, except that I think that the, using the, the existing handles now is, got, is actually not so difficult. So we should, we should, we should be able to do something. <coughs> Dark green, which is coming out as light green, in box rotation here, is something where I would say nowadays we just have got it solved. And light green, which is kind of yellow still, is tech language, and spacing and fonts, is where I would say yes we have to solve, but some parts of it are yellow. So that's why it's light green. Okay, so this is sort of the overview and already in some sense the summary. Um, so let's look a little bit at what the individual points have been back then. And uh, let's start with line breaking. So, um, one of the things that I uh, remarked on in the talk was that there's no post processing possible uh, with the final lines uh, in, in tech based on their content. So, for give a simple example, if you have a paragraph being broken, um, the last line is always a decent line, because you have this um, space at the end of the paragraph that just puts the stuff into, into a decent, regardless of what the previous lines have in terms of um, space. So, I mean, if, if you have a very loose line at the second last line, it would be probably better to have the last line also a little bit more loose rather than just jumping from very loose to, to tight again, um, as an example. Um, no way to actually do this. Um, but now it's actually yellow, I would say, because if you take the blue attack, you, you actually have the paragraph, you have the notes, you can, you can introduce something. At this point, you can replace spaces, you can do that. The second point with uh, line breaking is that there is no real automatic possibility to uh, influence a paragraph shape depending on your final output point. Because tech has this model of doing things in steps. So it first breaks everything into paragraph and then you are in paragraphs. Um, but they may end up somewhere on the page. They may even get broken across a page. And um, there's no feedback from, from this kind of mechanism. There are tricks and, and things people have, have done, obviously, to, to solve parts of the problem, but the engine is, and, and the concepts behind it have not been addressing this, this topic. And as I said, I mean, it doesn't really fit into the tech model of, of this sort of structure. So, uh, really, this is sunk down in, in some sense. Uh, still, uh, with, with all the extensions, even with Lua tech extensions, there's, there's still problems in this approach. And then the third, third point was that I was making is about the line breaking algorithm and the parameters that influence it back then. And, um, there have been, I mean, this, this, this paragraph building is, is a huge thing. It's a complex algorithm. It has, I don't know, 20, 25 different parameters where you can tweak. And I would say most people, if not everybody, is not really understanding, understanding even less. Um, but then if you, if you would have, say, 10 gradual things or 8 or something like this, uh, you would get much better 
um, control in, in more difficult situations that the algorithm will then take something which is more um, consistent um, over, the, all, over the whole paragraph rather than having one or two lines being really bad and the, the rest being decent. Um, the extension is not, wouldn't be that difficult to build into the algorithm, but um, well, actually no engine tried to touch that part of tech. The only engine that did it, in some sense, is again newer tech, but only in the sense that you can replace the algorithm with your own algorithm, uh, which is uh, <laughs> a bit more than I'm asking for here, uh, because the algorithm as such is not that bad, and re-implementing the whole algorithm in Lua is going to be a challenge. That's why it's dark, um, uh, orange or something. Okay, uh, but it would be possible if, if somebody really goes, goes for it and, and works, on, works on this. And then um, stuff that requires um, research is, for example, the question of um, rivers. Rivers are those funny little white streams going through your paragraph because for some reasons uh, the white space between words happen to fall you're really unlucky, say straight, or they go like this, and you can really see this white space. And that's <coughs> considered in high quality hand type setting rather uh, sort of not so high quality uh, situation. But we have no handle to it. We have no algorithms, no ideas, I would say at the moment, how to actually sort of identify them. Um, but I, I wouldn't say it's, it's impossible. Another example in that space is identical words. It looks really not only ugly, if you have the same word on, on, on two consecutive lines at the starting point. The starting point is even, even worse than on the, on the right hand side. Um, but it is also bad for reading. Because if you have the same word twice, you might end up reading the same line again because you're, you're sort of picking up what word is likely to come next, so you see the word, but you may see it on the wrong line, because it's next to each other. And uh, so those kind of things would be something where the algorithm could work on the content, do something better than it currently does, but it would require actually extending the ideas of how the algorithm works. Again, now we have a possibility here in theory, because somebody could go and, and do research and come up with a nice extension or a new version of the algorithm, plug it into the word tag and go. The only thing is, somebody has to do the research. <laughs> okay, so that's whatever it was, line breaking. So let's come to spacing. That was the second topic. And to go a bit faster, I guess. Um, there's no flexible interword spacing. That was at least true at the point in time back then. Example, every space is considered equal in tech. The only way to change how the space is stretching or shrinking is by the space factor. But that is based on a single character in front of you. So if you have the dot, you can have more space after, after a period. Uh, but uh, in fact, uh, for good quality type setting, if you have to squeeze things, or if you have to stretch things, it shouldn't be stretching or squeezing at the same rate. Because it depends on the characters on both sides, whether that squeezing actually sort of breaks the words, keeps the words apart still, or whether it makes the reading very difficult. And here's an example where different spaces should actually squeeze differently. And the second last line is, is the one oh, can I do it this way? It's what is the one where everything fits into the box, but the spacing is different on each of those characters, uh, each of those spaces, according to the numbers of more or less on the top. And this was one of the examples I gave back then, which I got a lot of heat for because the um, authority on that one was a obscure German designer <laughs> that I cited. Put Hermann's up. <laughs> <laughs> and some people 
um, make rude comments about why why should should you bother about somebody not known to any anybody in the world <laughs> <laughs> having um, ideas on on how to do proper spacing mm -hmm. don't certainly got it right. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, we can solve this now, I mean, in theory. You get the line, you could do the spacing adjustments afterwards by looking at the nodes in the attack. That's a possibility. Um, second one is no inter, uh, flexible intercharacter spacing. Now, this is an area where we certainly debate on whether flexible intercharacter spacing is a good thing or not a good thing. Again, um, I'm not going to into into uh, that debate here, but PF Tech incorporates um, the ideas that Herman Zapf had on, on, on how to do some font distortions um, to, to make us, instead of doing spacing, changing slightly the fonts on certain levels, whether that's acceptable, not acceptable, is, is certainly out, out in the open in certain places, it makes, makes good solutions, others may, may not be, but we have it. <laughs> Means I have five minutes left or something? No, no. <laughs> okay. 25. Okay. Uh, and the native support for hanging punctuation. I mean, Don already in the tech book gave an example of hanging punctuation, so we have it in tech. Uh, it didn't sure. quite work 100%. <laughs> so you, you have to, to do a lot of, lot of things. But, but PDF tech now introduced hanging punctuation as sort of a concept in the engine. And if you use that, it, it really works. And uh, it's certainly something that can improve your, your, your quality of your documents. So on the whole, I think the spacing area has, has, has improved over the 20 years quite a lot. It's different with page breaking. That's what I wrote back then in, 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 in 1990. Uh, basically, tech takes this paragraph building, right? But it didn't do, it stopped short on page breaking. Because page breaking was kind of an afterthought. And then you cut somewhere. And floats, oh yeah, inserts. But inserts are not are good for footnotes, but that's about it, I would say. And maybe for, for Don's books, which are fairly light in terms of uh, complex layout structures. Um, so, yeah, this is all based on the glue, um, text glue penalty uh, box model, which I quickly. Try to. I, I believe you can't read that. I guess. <laughs> Can you? No. But, no. <laughs> but roughly, roughly, what it is trying to tell you is you have this this blue stuff, which is the horizontal stuff, and, and as long as you stay there, you, you, you put characters in, into a horizontal line, and you get an un, un, uh, unset horizontal list. And what you can do with this unset horizontal list is two things. One, you can build H books. That's the blue one on the right. And from there, you can go back to an unset list by doing unpitch box. So you stay in this blue part, basically. Or you can go down here, break it into paragraph, lose stuff at the paragraph lines, because the stuff is thrown away. You end up with an unset vertical list. And then you're actually down here. You're not getting back, or not very much. You can remove the last box if there is a last box. You can remove the last current and the last penalty, but if you're unlucky and the last thing in your vertical list is neither of those three, like for example a, a um, special or something else, then you, you're done. You, you're really at the end of your, your feather, basically, and uh, you only can work down here. So basically, you go from paragraph building to page building, and, and whatever you've done with the paragraph building is basically the end of the story. And yeah, so this is the, the situation in the model. And uh, well, none of the engines actually changed anything on this, really. Um, so we have a problem here, I would say. And the consequence of that problem is, as I said, um, we, 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 we are jumping from one, one sort of typesetting horizontal stuff to Typesetting vertical stuff, and we have no good interaction. But there are possibilities now, and this is really where I started my talk. In some sense, uh, what we are currently, what I'm currently thinking about here, doing. Um, okay, so we come to this later. 
page layout, we all know that automatic building of com complex float layout is really not uh, something of the strength of tech, regardless of the flavor, whether it's LaTeX, context, whatever. A um, couple of examples quickly. Um, this is a magazine, a uh, games magazine, and what you can see is four columns. You see uh, um, a flow down here spanning two columns, down here spanning two columns. You have some sort of inline floats. You have a float here spanning <laughs> one and a half columns, uh, which gives you very ugly spacing, but that's a different story. Um, but this is kind of the design that this, this magazine has. And it's actually tech produced. Oh, this is late tech produced, in fact. But, uh, and the source is quite nice, actually, looking, looking at it. But it, it's a lot of hand um, decisions putting certain control points in. It's not automatically produced. Um, but it's, a lot, it's, it's actually doing OK. So people are interested in doing this kind of thing, obviously. Um, Another example is, is this one I stolen from um, a question on um, the Tech Exchange um, site. This is um, Oxford University Press, some journal or whatever. You see two graphics and you see the captions on the left because the graphics on the right doesn't have space for the captions and the second captions also on the left column. Now, you can argue whether that's a good design, but it's the design the Oxford University Press has for this um, journal or book set. And um, yeah, do this with tech, do it automatically. And <laughs> fun. OK, so uh, yeah, research efforts. Let's go here. Not much, really, I would say. There was a Michael Plus uh, PhD. There was a little bit around 95. Um, by somebody in Germany, Wolfile, and um, he was um, a student from Anne Brüggemann Klein, um, another PhD, I think. Then I did a paper on uh, formatting complex stuff with floats for LaTeX 3 in around 2000. Stayed at this quality level as a prototype. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there are two more. The last one is from, from 2007, basically, thinking about this kind of solutions. Nothing, nothing in terms of support in any engine. And as I said, for LaTeX 3, we do have a, a, a prototype version which was left alone for a long, long time, and we are now currently in the process of, of um, rebuilding that, so I'm, I have some hopes to actually get it. Uh, in, a, in a usable state at some point in time now, having Joseph and, and Will and other people actually sort of uh, doing the hard work. Um, okay, so this is um, the situation here. Then grid line support is not really the strength of tech. Um, this example I think is really nice because if you want to do grid line typesetting, you actually have to get this space here right, <coughs> right, uh, baseline to baseline. The problem is this baseline skip is not known until you're at the end of the paragraph. To put something in here, you have to do it before you actually touch it. It's a bit of a tricky situation. So if, if the baseline skip changes because you change the font size or something, then your grid is completely gone. Technically speaking, you can solve it. People have tried it. Um, you need some rigorous control on, on, on what you do in LaTeX context or so, but it, it really limits you because the engine is really not set up. Um, so this is more, more kind of yellow. Um, sorry, that was baseline to baseline spacing. I talked about grid design, but it is conceptually <laughs> related to it. So um, again, with grid design, we, we have in this uh, output routine for, for, for LaTeX 3, uh, we have this, a solution that, that kind of works nicely, um, but it's not production ready. And with 
um, new attack, you have additional possibilities. So this is this is coming together to some extent um, on, on, on those levels nowadays with the additional possibilities of the engine. <coughs> okay, the next topic was penalties. Um, if you have two consecutive penalties in tech, you get the minimum. And this is not always what you want, because, for example, if you want to prevent page breaking, then something like a video penalty is, is making you just ignore your wish. Because the video penalty comes along and says 150, not 10,000. <laughs> and uh, so it's, it's a perfect breakpoint. And uh, to solve that, what you really have to do is is is, is to reprogram all these these, these situations and, and go and, and, and think ahead. What kind of penalties and stuff do I need to change for this situation so not to upset my my, my um, state? And that is not working very well. Which is why people get their breaks in the wrong places and complain about it. And manually fix it afterwards. So, so something like an organized layout that, that actually can tell why something like uh, these nice attempts like same page and so on, in, in LaTeX, they work to a certain level, but then you still have to look whether they really worked in your document <laughs> or they accepted. Um, again, LuaTeX gives you more chance here to do something, but uh, it is not really supporting it. I mean, the idea of having a different algorithm of, of how consecutive penalties are being triggered would be the much cleaner solution to this. And, and for this, we don't have anything in the end. OK, now a simple one, hyphenation. Doesn't work. Didn't work then, doesn't work now. Uh, what I mean by this is um, more than two consecutive hyphens, tough. Manual fix on each 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 place where it happens. Uh, assigning weights to the hyphenation um, in, in in languages like German, for example, we have uh, words. Um, we, we, we tend to build long words, so we put words together uh, from from different places and, 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 and make it one word. And so you have a lot of hyphen points in, in, in those because each of the individual parts of the words. Uh, words in their own right, they have a lot of hyphenation points. So the natural place to, to hyphenate is between sort of compound words. It's the best place, really. And then, of course, in each of the compound words, you have hyphen points as well. They are second, second quality. <laughs> and depending on what kind of word this is, um, you, you, you better don't hyphenate at all or, or only in an absolute emergency. So um, I think one of the examples that I gave in the talk back then was um, a word called Spargel, uh, Spargelder, which means um, 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 which means um, savings, um, money. Um, Spar means saving, and Gelder is a plural of money. Uh, so that makes it together Spargelder. Now you can hyphenate this as Spargelder, which would be good. You can hyphenate as Spargelder. It's also possible. The problem is Spargel meets asparagus. Uh, so if you get this, it's not really good. Or if you have something like Kloster, um, which means um, Abbey or something, uh, the first part, Klo, it means toilet. Again, it gives you kind of the wrong thing if that happens at the end of your page or at the end of the, um, the line. So, there is a good argument for having a better algorithm, better in the sense that you can have weighted hyphenation points that guide the algorithm to, to choose more than just yes or no, which is currently what the algorithm can do. And, well, no research, no nothing. And more, more generally, um, the Algorithm, the way tech does it, is very good. Works quite nicely. And um, Mozilla is now trying to get it into, into the um, browser. And we had a long fight about licenses <laughs> and 
Carl will be <laughs> remembering that with um, some pleasure, <laughs> probably. Um, anyway, but it is not good necessarily for all type of languages because it, it is working well for, for certain type of languages. So there's still the question of couldn't we have or shouldn't we have possibilities to hyphenate differently um, depending on the language having more than one algorithm. Now, again, none of the extensions of tech at the current point in time consider replacing the algorithm depending on, say, the, the current language with a different approach. So there's no book in Lua tech to do this and there's nothing in any of the other languages. Uh, sorry, any of the other engines. Okay, so this is kind of dark red. It works for, for the languages we, we have used largely in, in, in Western uh, Latin um, arenas and it works. And if it doesn't work, you, you have to make yourself or you just don't notice it happens. Um, that's okay, um, next block was box rotation. Um, back then, you have to remember this is just after tech 3, there's no late tech 2 e there's, um, there's 209 and so we didn't have rotation at all working. We had rotation at some driver level for some drivers, but it was all very specific to the driver. So if you would, would actually use it, then your document wouldn't work on, on somebody else's site at all because those specials you had to put in, they, they wouldn't, wouldn't be understood by somebody else's driver. So that was not a solution back then, but we got that solved. I mean, uh, we introduced with LaTeX 2E this intermediate layer with an abstract interface for, for color, for, 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 for rotation, for, uh, for um, stretching, shrinking, um, graphics, clipping, what have you. And on the whole, that abstraction works really well. I mean, over time we have basically got this working for any kind of tech output device support and uh, as a user you would, would be on a level where it didn't matter what kind of output device would, would actually do the operation at the end of the day. So that I think is, is, is something we could consider solved. Maybe not in the best possible way but you know, in, a, in a reasonable working way. So that's, that's one of the things that I, I really think are green after 20 years. Actually it was after four or five. Um, on the question of fonts, situations are all not so bad. I mean, I, I raised the question about additional parameters coming from the font and guiding the typesetting. Nowadays, I'm not so sure that was a good idea. Um, basically, because in the font world, there is not enough consistency to actually make that work. So even if there's information in some fonts, most others would, wouldn't have the same information and so on and so forth. So that's, that's one I, I think I was, was a bummer back then. Um, font encoding standardization, I think that was very important and we got it right for the 8-bit fonts. First of all, we had the um, LICR, LaTeX Internal Character uh, Encoding character representation and the, the main thing here was that you got an abstract representation of some, well basically some Unicode character before Unicode became sort of really widely available um, that would do allow a round trip. So it wouldn't matter what font actually would finally be used to typeset it, the thing would redefine itself to fit the final typesetting font it would also redefine itself in a way that it would survive going into the AUX file and coming <coughs> back and maybe in a different place being typeset by a different font where the character is in a di different sp uh, place and so on and so forth. So largely I would say for the 8-bit fonts introducing uh, font and introducing input and we really sort of got a, a nice round trip and for the Western characters more or less the uh, usable uh, solution. 
Now with the availability of open type fonts, you get new issues with the availability of, of, of Unicode, you get new challenges, but on the whole, I think, this is coming together still uh, nicely. And then the last point that I introduced as a, as a, as a question uh, was the ability to um, adjust kernings and ligatures depending on the language you, you actually types in. Because depending on your language, some of the ligatures should not actually appear, or vice versa, you should have additional kernings. For example, in, in, in German language, you have between C and K uh, kerning, um, bringing those closer together. You do not have all of the FF ligatures in, in, in high quality type setting, but only some, and those kind of things. And there is not a possibility to do this, uh, this kind of manipulation in, uh, in tech, except you really provide clones of fonts with different um, tables. Now, with Lua tech, the situation is slightly different, because you can sort of manipulate these font tables inside Lua tech, um, but it's still, uh, I would say, rather an open situation, so it's a bit of plus minus. But on the other hand, it's not something that I would consider being on sort of high-end problems. It's more like a very, very micro type uh, thing. <laughs> tables, uh, tables, yeah, H-line, V-line, are all very great, but uh, you can't really do horizontally and vertically spaced um, tables at the same time um, in, a, in a decent manner. So if you if you have stuff where you want to span columns, fine, works. Tabular in LaTeX does does it for you to a certain extent. If you at the same time have certain column uh, certain cells being spanned vertically as well, then you're, you're down to doing everything manually. And it's very complex, and it's not very nice, and it, it doesn't work quite well. And <coughs> basically, it would mean thinking about that. extended different algorithms, and HLI is one of those really complex things <laughs> in tech. So what's the word in, in somewhere in the tech book, or in the, in, the, in the code? I'm still surprised that this is working. <laughs> 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 so um, yeah, nothing really happened, I would say. What, what we have, we can live with, but it's not necessarily fun. And in, in, in terms of some busy big type setting systems, I'm not going to name, five minutes, good. It's, um, it's um, they are better in this space. Okay, math. Um, there are a lot of math constructs which are done really nice, nicely. There are some which are done not very well, and we have to do sort of manually fix it with meshes and what have you. Um, AMS tag introduced a lot of sort of stuff to, to, to fix those problems. And uh, in some sense, that, that resolved the sort of immediate need. But you could, could say if the engine the math producing uh, and part of the engine would, would have some more support for stuff like double accent and those kind of things, and we would, would end up in a better shape. The spacing rules, um, it was all hardwired in tech or in the fonts. That has changed with Lunatech. They, they can change everything around. Um, and this is one of those things which I still believe is um, unsolved right now. Uh, whenever you put a brace group in, into math, you, you freeze the whole subformula to a natural size. Um, and that means that something like um, left right works differently from uh, doing, um, doing the stuff without automatic sizing. And, uh, and that, those kind of things. You can see that, that things come out wrong depending on the situation, and there's no solution in the current engine. And I mean, Lua Tech has the possibility to, to, to um, 
replace the whole thing by something else. But you don't want to replace the whole life with it. <laughs> Just want to fix um, those kind of things. This is this is good. And then there's this problem of mouse and stomach separation, like uh, you have the microcode and you end up with boxes and then you're in some other way of, of, of problem. So, um, yeah, yeah, now I have about two minutes to go, get to the initial thing. Let's look at, what is this? Sorry. The idea of solutioning uh, the question of getting rid of paragraphs are being broken first, and then you, you do the um, you do the uh, page breaking at the second time. But but how can you sort um, re-breaking paragraphs? So basic idea. Uh, let's look at the model again. Uh, well, I, I talked a little bit about the model. The problem is you have to prevent tech from really breaking your paragraph in the first place. You want to keep, that's the idea, you want to keep the paragraph um, in a basically horizontal form. So what you can do, you try to do this unset horizontal list and save it in a, in a huge H box. And then if you do this, then um, you can later un H box and run it in different tests and, 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 and it doesn't conflict with your macro programming because you're actually on the on, on the box level already. So so something like like um, changes of, of uh, counters have happened once when you sort of got it into this um, list structure, but it's not happening several times because you do trials. Because then you have to keep track of everything, every package that might introduce a counter <laughs> or something, and redo this, and and you just just lose. Um, whenever there is something that is actually vertical. You have to stop your H boxing, grab the vertical stuff, put it safely somewhere, and then start doing, getting stuff into the H box. And um, yeah, so this is this is roughly the initial idea. So it should be done, it should be possible in tech um, three, really. So what's the pitfall? Pitfall is you can't start an H box. And, and, and do your scanning, and when you see something vertical, you close the brace <laughs> and then wrap the vertical. The problem is, anything that is happening while you're doing your H box, like font change, is then tied to this box. So your font is suddenly stopping just because you have a footnote. Um, that's not what you want. So um, what you need to do uh, is, is, is to do this differently. And, yeah, I said that already. And the refinement is we are actually typesetting into, into a V-box. We're building a paragraph, except that we make it very wide, max demand, basically, and hope that nobody except James Joyce or somebody <laughs> is, is, is actually typesetting uh, with tech. Thomas uh, OK, fine. <laughs> we have a solution for that as well. But the point is, um, we, we, we go, and if we want to interrupt, we just introduce a paragraph um, and pick from the last, pick from, from the typeset paragraph the last box, chuck out the paragraph fill and whatever it got, got added, and we have our H box. But this is now without actually introducing a grouping structure. Hmm. So some something like font changes work and, and those kind of things. Okay, so this is this. And the second point is we, we, we also have to look at um, something like force breaks, because if there's a force break happen, then there would be a paragraph line change, and then we lose stuff, because all the discardable stuff is getting lost. So whenever we see a penalty, we have to look what happened, and make sure that it doesn't produce a line break. So we have to stop um, paragraph breaking and doing the same magic. But that's doable. So the limitation that really end up is the Joyce paragraph. And that is something you can detect. And if nothing else, you can at least say, hey, guy, fix your paragraph, make it two. Give me a point where I can break it for, for that. That's, that's a limitation. And I think that's doable. Um, Max Dinan means something like one and a half pages on a typically A4 paper thing. OK, so um, 
That's what I said. Remedies? <clears throat> yeah, but you can do even better. You can use LuaTeX. And uh, the trick there is um, you just take the paragraph builder, throw it away, and say, whenever you're finished doing the paragraph, just give me the whole long line. <laughs> don't, don't bother doing anything about it. Uh, and you're done. You get, get this thing. It could even be larger than MaxDemand now. Mm -hmm. don't, you're only not allowed to look at the size, but otherwise it works. And, and you're fine. The only problem is um, nobody ever tried to use this call back in LuaTeX until I came along and tried it. <laughs> it just doesn't work. <laughs> um, well, that's, that's fixable. Um, but the board is already out on the... Oops, was not what I wanted to do. Um, so you can introduce um, a little bit of magic and, and fix it even already in the current system in LuaTeX. So that, that's really a neat solution. It ends up with five five lines of that, and you have the same as about 80 lines of tech count getting the same as this limitation. So, um, jumping here. So basically, uh, that will come within LaTeX 3 Expo as, a, as an interface, so you can scan stuff into, into a data structure that you can then safely use for, for rebreaking. My, the, the initial implementation is going to be, um, as I said, caption handling. That's where I started to look for it. But obviously, you can go much further. You can have the whole galley being first scanned into, into this data structure, and then, by the way, start building your pages. And you can have flows that are sitting half making paragraph shapes and you can just flow the text around it because you have this, this data structures stopgap of paragraphs are being built tough too late to change the size that is gone so um, yeah so that that will be the solution for this topic was uh, within text language and on the whole that means I think the language uh, has, uh, has not that many problems the way we, we, we saw it about uh, 20 years ago, or I saw it about 20 years ago. So, conclusions, uh, five minutes over time, so I have to do them backwards. Um, basically, and I can't read that, what did I conclude? <laughs> uh, basically, if the whole thing is, is, is still quite red or orange. We now have all the tools for 90% of the questions, of quality questions that are raised 20 years ago, we haven't resolved many of them, in fact, in reality. So the question is, is it actually needed? Like if you can do 20 years without it, why, why bother now? Um, because I, I, I won't want to have, have a talk, maybe. <laughs> um, but the, the real reason is, it is needed because people actually use it to just struggle and do it manually. And, um, so I think there's a clear yes to that question. And uh, yeah, the task now would be to use the new possibilities, um, either Lua or other ways. And uh, I'm really looking forward to, to have that possibility with Lua becoming as stable as it is already now. Uh, and also with um, stuff like the underlying programming layer that we have built for Lecture 3. So I think a lot of those questions can actually be raised in complex types I think we um, and page layer of those. And that's about it. Thank you very much. Give me one question for Frank while Steve has set it up. Anybody? Um, I don't want to add to your problems, but I had a serious problem which I finally resolved just by hand. Uh, my, in the last line of the paragraph, the formula on the line above had a very deep math uh, subscript, and the next line, which was very short, consisted basically of something with a very high superscript, and there was a huge, horrible-looking space between them. Yeah, I, uh, absolutely, and it is actually 
I think I gave gave that one twenty years ago as well, which is which which is that you have this um, you have this skyscraper situation. I mean, characters are high or low, and um, the, the the tech model is that you basically have the highest one being, being um, the one that tells you about the line. But, but, but obviously, very often this this is not conflicting. You have something going down here and something coming up here, and you could stay with 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 this proper line spacing that you want to have without any conflict. Again, I would say that question is in theory solved if you if you want it because you can look at the bro broken lines and, and, and make your skyscraping comparison on, on something like Luatech. Again, it is only solved in theory because in practice there's nothing on the algorithm but you have the tools. So yes, it, it, it could become automatic. Now, it couldn't become automatic 20 years ago, and it couldn't become automatic other than this, this new one so far. Thank you.